I've got a couple minutes here, and I want to talk about uh, a project which really kind of expanded my understanding of what the built environment and the health of the built environment could be and should be when we talk about architecture. Uh, it, does this work? It does not work. Slide, please. I'm calling it low fab. It's called the, the social and economic determinants of a healthy built environment. I actually think you also have the wrong um, deck up. <laughs> oh, I know what happened. You have it the last slide. So you have to put it on slide one. That's what it is. So everybody, how's everybody doing? <laughs> so I'll talk, this is a project in Haiti, and I, we can maybe touch on a little bit the projects we've done in Rwanda and elsewhere. But uh, this one really kind of changed my life and changed the way I think about not just what a building can do, but how a building process can improve lives. Um, so I'm calling it low fab, and, uh, and I'll get to what that means. So in 2010, we all know that the earthquake in Haiti really changed, well, significantly changed, but killed over 250,000 people. Uh, but as an architect, I really saw this as a, as a failure of building. You know, this wasn't the earthquake that killed people, this was buildings that fell on people after an earthquake, which killed these people. Uh, and I think, in some sense, the architectural community, the design community, really felt responsible, accountable to this. They felt a need to respond, and there was a significant outpouring of response from not only, uh, let's say, young student designers in schools, but a, uh, the profession in general. They felt that, finally, this is a, a clear example of where architecture has failed. It's failed people, and it's killed and hurt people. And we needed to do something about it. Great intent, but a lot of the results that happened, a lot of the, out, uh, a lot of the strategies that people came up with weren't really filling the bigger problem that was happening in Haiti. We saw a lot of uh, unique solutions that came out of design studios, which were what we might call prefabricated solutions, ones that could be easily erected, built uh, ahead of time, let's say in America, shipped over, easily constructed. Um, but something about that, when it came into the field in Haiti, and this was built in, in a district in Haiti, was really not only uninspiring, but kind of oppressive, right? This prefabricated solution of housing as a solution uh, was not a solution to the bigger, bigger social determinants that were affecting lives in Port-au-Prince. It, it reminded me about something that I thought was actually incorrect, that prefabrication, which has been considered a solution of the built environment because we do things quicker and cheaper, relies on a, a, an equation. It reduces the amount of labor uh, and focuses on materials because labor is expensive in the U.S. and materials are, are cheaper. But in Haiti, it's the inverse. In, in resource-poor settings, it's actually an inverse equation. Labor is very inexpensive and materials are cheap. So why would we be offering this solution to solve big, big problems that are happening in a place like Port-au-Prince? We started to think about this when we were asked to come and work on a hospital uh, to treat cholera after the outbreak of, of cholera in, in Port-au-Prince and thought, how do we design a, a project which actually focus on maximizing labor in order to address these social determinants of the failure of the built environment, i.e. give as many people jobs as possible, focus on who can build as opposed to just what is built, what is built cheaply and quickly. And we thought about some of the, the incredible, brilliant um, craftsmen in Port-au-Prince, like these metal workers uh, that unroll steel drums and turn them into some beautiful, ornate uh, metal work that's famous all over the world and especially all over the Caribbean. How could we design something that not only performs to improve health, but also leverages this expertise and employs as many Haitians as possible? Uh, and we developed a project and thought about a project which, instead of minimizing labor, maximizes labor. And this is Mackenzie Ville, uh, who runs one of these incredible uh, crafts uh, artisan shops, and him and his sandals, working on this new construction of this project, which he, we had designed in our laboratory, but then he also handmade and developing a skin system which performs to in introduce natural ventilation, uh, in introduce privacy uh, and lighting in, in the facility, but all made by hand, all made by these local artisans, is uh, 36,000 individual cuts by, by individual hands. And the idea came about that this was a way to leverage and maximize the individual hands that touch a project, the opposite of prefabrication. In the end, we, we ended up uh, developing this cholera treatment center, a center which also is not just about who makes it, but also about how it performs. And in this center in particular, a building to address the reduction in cholera, a diarrheal disease, um, one that is really about the failure of the built environment in general. It's a failure of water and sanitation. So how does a building address that? Um, so this center, which opened up uh, two months ago, which um, uh, is about addressing not just the systemic failure of the built environment, but also about trying to bring about a new way of building. And you can see that here. 
And the way that happens is that it collects the uh, contaminated waste of patients that come in here and it decontaminates it on site. So it's actually a, a wastewater treatment facility underneath the pavilion facility. And those two things together really made us realize that one, buildings can heal and building processes can heal. And so we think about this as something we call locally fabricated or low fab, a way of approaching the built environment that's not about, that's about maximizing labor and thinking about outcomes and impacts, especially health impacts, as opposed to maximizing how fast and how quick we can build something. This is in some sense a, a diagram of that. Another way to think about this is what's the slow food movement of the built environment, right? We don't want to call it slow fab though because no one would hire us. <laughs> I think this is, um, but I think this is actually a really, really important question, not just for resource poor settings, but for architecture and buildings in general. This is the Qatar Stadium uh, that's uh, being built, the World Cup Stadium right now. And as some of you may have heard, over 850 people have already died in the construction of this project. So this is, or this whole campus, right? That's an epidemic of death, um, to use some health terms. That's about not focusing on the way in which a building is built and how it impacts the individual lives of who, build it, who builds it. And so we have to ask more than just what a building does. What a building is, we have to ask what a building does. And not just what a building does as it performs when it's finished, but how we make a building and how we focus on redesigning that process of building to impact lives every day so they can actually benefit not just from, its, from the existence of the, uh, the services that building has, but from being proud of it and its continuation as an entity of economic driver and economic engine for, for time to come. So I'd like you to think, when you think about buildings out in your communities, ask this question, not just what's its environmental impact, not just do you like it or not, but ask who built it. And how do we maximize that question? How do we ask who builds? And that, I think, is a future important health question of uh, the built environment. Thank you. Thanks, um, thanks so much, Michael. Um, those are just such stunning photographs. I don't know if you felt that same rush that I felt, but that is not at all what I expected a cholera center to look like. Um, I remember the first time that I visited the hospital that Michael and others designed in um, rural Rwanda, and it looked nothing like any hospital I had ever been in in the United States. And um, they are true pioneers in that way. Uh, they really believe that everyone deserves good design. Um, Michael, years ago, was kind enough to introduce me to someone else that, that believes and practices this, this notion that um, everyone deserves good design. And she's working uh, in the space of, of product and industrial design, specifically with health products. Um, Krista is not your average designer. Um, she is an engineer, she's a PhD. She uh, was an economic officer with the US State Department in Iraq. Um, she is the mother of two beautiful children and just so many other things. And you've probably, uh, if you read Fast Company magazine or one of these other magazines that identifies creativity and innovation, you will almost certainly have heard of Krista. You're about to learn more about how she practices right now. I love it when my kids are, are mentioned as part of my introduction. Um, so I am going to take this opportunity. I'm going to talk about product development, and I'm going to tell you about three principles we've learned with product development as we've done our work. And I want to go back to some of the things Michael said and what John said, but what we really believe about design. And that is that design is so much more than the functionality of the product, whether it's a building or it's a medical device, no matter what it is. Good design dignifies. And in health particularly, it simplifies, it enables agency, and it also brings hope. So it's not just a thing, you know, it solves a problem. So, three, first of the three principles, design for the user. And I'm going to start with a very straightforward example from my own life. I've got it in my pocket. How many of you wear contacts? All right, so a good number of you. So if you're American, you're one of 30 million in the US who wears contacts. And from a design standpoint, contacts do what they're supposed to do, right? You can see. You can do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But from a packaging standpoint, they actually don't work very well for me. If you wash your hands before you use them, which we're all supposed to do, at least in this case, they're very hard to open, if, even if your hands are slightly wet. 
And also, you can tell they're very much designed for the distributor and the manufacturer. Oftentimes, too, when I take my contacts out, they're inside out. And I struggle with trying to, if I put them in, trying to get them back out, all sorts of things. And then the last thing that really bugs me, and I think maybe because I'm a designer, is that it comes in strips of five. I have two eyes, <laughs> which is an even number. And I'm one of those people that the prescription is the same in both of my eyes. And so I'm always looking for an extra one. Um, let's go on to the next principle. So you're not just designing for the end user. Um, you're designing for all the users who, who are part of using your product. And I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about one of our products that we did. We designed phototherapy for severely jaundiced babies, and as part of our field work, we spent quite a bit of time in neonatal intensive care units. And this is a photo from India. And so when you think about all the users who interact with a product, the end user here is the baby. And you can see the babies um, in the photo. But there's also the family. There's a mom sitting down on the floor next to her baby. There's nurses who interact with the product. There's also the doctor. And in addition to the doctor, there's the technician who has to repair the device. There's a distributor. There's the key purchasing decision maker. All of these people have to have their needs met. And what you're looking at, and don't worry, you don't have to dig too much into it, is we've mapped them all out. Because otherwise, how do you know what all of those, all of those users need? And a lot of times, these users aren't consistent in what they want out of a product. And so you have to figure out how to balance them, how to make trade-offs between what various users want. The third principle um, is designed for the system. And this is a big lesson learned for us, too, because typically, even if you design a good product, it still has to function in an environment. What you're looking at here is the prosthetic knee, or prosthetic leg. And the photo is from the Jaipur Foot Clinic in India. This is a long-term, long-time partner of DREV. And to get a sense of what a prosthetic leg is, you have the socket. You can see at the top, it fits over the residual limb. There's the knee the pylon, which is like the shin, and then the foot. And we work on the knee, and that's because the knee is the most expensive and complex part of that entire system. But we had some interesting findings as we visited various clinics, like this one that you see here in Nairobi. Even if you design the best products, there's still problems in the system. These four processes were very busy on the day that we visited, um, but they weren't fitting patients. And the reason was is that the foot hadn't arrived. And so as part of this system, the supply chain wasn't working. And as we dug in more, we also found out that there aren't enough skilled prosthesis to fit all the amputees who had the need for well-fit prosthetics. So it caused us to rethink, too, how do we solve this problem if that's really what it's about? And so now we're looking at how do we bundle all the components in a system to make sure it gets to clinics on time. We're working with um, Dr. Pooja Mokul at the Jaipur Foot Clinic in India to develop curriculum to help with training new processes. Because at the end of the day, it's about solving the problem. Thank you, Krista. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Krista. Um, you know, when, when, when Krista's organization and Michael's organization, as well as one other panelist, uh, Jocelyn's, came online, um, I really felt, as somebody who was trained as an architect and who saw really poor but well-intentioned designs for clinics or for products or other things. Um, I, I saw a lot of those things that had just simply failed over the years. And when I saw them come online with this like, really professionalized model, I knew that this was the end of that kind of tyranny of low expectations. We had actually come to expect that a clinic in a developing country or a product that was given to somebody in a developing country um, that it didn't need to look as good or feel as good or function as well as products that we would expect when we purchase here in, um, in the US or elsewhere. Uh, and one of the things I love most about the little that I know of our, our next panelist, um, Rushka Fernandopoli, um, is that he is looking at the broader healthcare delivery system and he's trying to end the, our own kind of tyranny of low expectations when it comes to healthcare and primary care. And he is looking at it from the vantage point of a doctor, but also of a service provider. And he's looking at the redesign of health services and systems. And I really can think of no uh, thing that needs more redesign at this point uh, in this space than exactly those services and systems. So Rushika, if you'd like to join us, thank you.
So I get to use the uh, Oprah mic here. <laughs> that that uh, teaches me not to come late for the panel meeting. Um, so, so what we've been really working on is exactly as we said, is, is really system redesign. And, and uh, you know, part of that is the built environment, part of that is the products we use, but really taking a broader look. Uh, and as you mentioned, really the bar, if you think about the system of how, we have amazing tools in healthcare, right? Amazing tools of new devices, new drugs, new surgeries. The way we actually deliver it to people is awful. Right, the experience we have is poor too often. It robs us of our dignity. Uh, the outcomes are embarrassing. So if you have hypertension in this country, uh, only about 55% of the people with hypertension actually have their blood pressure under control. Not that we don't have good drugs or good science, it's we don't have systems in place to actually deliver it. And this is, comes at you know, a huge waste. You know, $3.5 trillion, one in six dollars that we spend in this country. And we know, uh, almost everyone knows that about a third of that is waste, right? Uh, Don Berwick, one of my uh, idols, often says that every system is perfectly designed to get the outcomes it gets, right? And the problem about our healthcare system is we've designed it not around what we think we should, outcomes for patients improving health, we've designed it around maximizing income for the providers. And that's why we get what we get. And uh, what a lot of people are doing in trying to tweak this existing system without confronting this fundamental design problem. So what we started to do about 10 years ago is what if we said we want to rebuild the system from the bottom up, starting with primary care, with just a fundamentally different design principle. This is not about maximizing income. This is about improving health of the population. What does it look like? Uh, and we've been doing this for a while. Um, and a couple of things we've learned along the way. So the first is it's really important to ask the right question. Right, and frame it not too little and not too big. Right, so I think uh, we did some work with um, IDEO, a great design firm, while uh, working with Mass General, a great health system. But they were asked, let's redesign the patient visit. Right, wrong question, right? Maybe the thing that the patient needs isn't a visit. We should redesign meeting the need of the patient, right? So broaden it. So too small is a problem. Other people frame the problem too big. So I worked at an interfaculty health policy program at Harvard. We were going to try and let's get all the stakeholders together, the drug companies, the hospital, the doctors, the specialists, uh, you know, and, and we're going to have everyone be happy, right? Well, the problem is that's how we got the current system, right? So you need to sort of narrow. That's too broad, right? So, so let's design. So our task was let's rebuild an operating system, which is a combination of system design, technology, space, uh, for patients, that's where we're optimizing for, to improve their health and keep them out of trouble, right? So, so point two is, now you need to figure out how you do this design, right? And so I think, uh, get the right people. And I think the mistake a lot of people make is they get what I'd call the gray-haired guys in the room, the people who are the heads of blank, right? But, but in some ways, they're the ones who created the current system. Uh, and, and, and if you do that, you're going to get exactly what we get now. So, you know, you get the people who are smart, creative, idealistic, out-of-the-box thinkers, a little tr bit troublemakers, right? The people who might become those gray-haired guys somewhere, or they might get fired and end up uh, being a guitar player, right? So that's, that's who you want. And get them in a room from different things. And they're not there defending their type. They're, they're acting both as patients, which we all will be, as well as whatever they are, a doctor, a nurse, whatever, right? Um, and get them to design it, right? Um, one of our design principles is when in doubt, if you have two choices, um, take the more radical route, right? Because you can always flip back and do the more conservative one. Uh, so just take the more radical route. Um, and then don't think you'll get it right the first time, right? Another principle is build very quickly. Build before you're ready. Right, because I think if you sit around, you know, on whiteboards all you want, so you need labs. So that's what we did, is we built a lab practice in Boston about 10 years ago where we could just try things, try things tomorrow, right, without studying it, collect data on it, collect feedback right away, and then tweak the model. So what we built now, and the other thing is if you're going to change a system, don't do it just in one place, right? Because you might get fooled because of quirky things. Do it in a bunch of different places with different sorts of populations because then you can learn what is it that's universal 
and what are things that can and should be different when you take it to different populations. So we now have 12 practices across the country serving very different populations. Casino workers in Las Vegas, we have freelance uh, yoga teachers and artists in Brooklyn, we have Medicare, over 65 seniors in um, Seattle and Phoenix, we have carpenters in Boston, um, and, and they're all our labs, right, where we can continue this design work. Uh, a few things we've done, you know, we have very robust teams, it's not about the doctor, uh, we have people from the community, we've evolved our own technology platform, um, and really I think if you think about designing the system, it's a really big task, but the problem is if you don't design the system, it will just happen and we end up with the thing we have now. So thank you. Rushika, I'm, I'm actually envious of that mic. It's uh, very commanding. Um, but if you want to come back up here, I'll give you your mic back. How about that? Um, so everyone, the, the, pan the presenters are going to join me on, on my right side. So Michael, I'll sit in the middle, and the respondents are going to be on, on this side. So uh, and Rushika, I'm going to give this back to you. Or you're going to be mic'd? OK, great. So thank you all for your attention. I hope, um, I hope these three people uh, expanded your, your thinking about design. Um, it's amazing to me hearing some of the things that Rushko was just talking about. Uh, and so I want to be sure to get back to those. But first, I'll introduce very briefly the, the three people who are, are joining us up on this stage. Um, they, each one of them could have easily spoken for that amount of time and, and frankly, much longer about their really extraordinary work. And so immediately to my left is Jocelyn Wyatt. Um, she is the co-lead and executive director of IDO.org. It's the nonprofit spin-off of innovation and strategy, giant, guru, whatever you call them, um, IDO. Uh, and she's done really amazing work all over the world and empowered lots of other people to do it uh, with a whole kind of curriculum around what they call human-centered design. Um, and you've seen this title, this name, I should say, bubble up into the healthcare space as patient-centered design or user-centered design. They're all effectively talking about the same thing, and it all starts with empathy, uh, the way that I think Krista mentioned. Um, immediately to Jocelyn's left is Chris Korsh, and he is a senior principal with HOK, a very large international architecture firm. He's based out of New York. Um, he told me a, an interesting story that uh, finally helped me connect him and um, Michael Murphy, who is our speaker, uh, about the healthcare work he's done in Haiti. But Chris said that um, he had actually gotten a call from the architecture columnist of the New York Times, uh, Michael Kimmelman. And his assistant said, hey, you've got this call from Michael Kimmelman. And he's just like, hey, Michael Kimmelman, at least the one that I read in the newspaper, doesn't write about hospitals, doesn't write about health. Um, it can't be the same guy, so it must be some other. It turned out it actually was the New York Times architecture critic uh, because health and design have risen really to that level. And he wrote a really compelling piece back in August of 2014 uh, that interviewed Chris and, and his client, um, as well as Michael, and, and talked about their work and really put this notion of health and design um, on uh, a lot of people's radars through that article. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then finally, we have um, uh, Kirsten Toby, who is with uh, Revolution Foods. And um, she's really involved, the way I understand it, in terms of the kind of systems design and service design. Uh, but she's bringing food, better food, to school cafeterias um, uh, around the country. And so, we're going to hear a little bit more from her. Um, what I first wanted to do was just give, we, we actually, several of us end up on a lot of the same panels together. Um, but we sometimes don't even have a chance to like debrief or talk about things. So I actually wanted to start with Jocelyn and give her a chance to reflect on um, at least jo uh, Michael and Krista's work that she knows extremely well, kind of as a respondent. Um, and so would love to just get any general impressions you have, anything that surprised you that you hadn't thought about, you took for granted and knowing them before. Yeah, um, no, I, I mean, great talks, guys. So, <laughs> really, um, really cool to see the work. I mean, I've obviously seen it before, and so, um, but you know, I think the thing that I love about what Mass does is that they really um, prioritize aesthetics. And I think so often um, in the field of design for social impact, we focus so much on the impact, which is fantastic, and so little on the design. Um, and so I think what Mass does so well is to really um, think about the beauty and the dignity that beauty really creates in communities. And um, through really spectacular design work is really able to sort of show the world that different possibilities um, are
are out there in terms of how we think about designing with communities. Um, I think what I love about Chris's work is really the sort of integration um, and really holding, I think designers so often don't hold ourselves accountable to the outcomes, we hold ourselves accountable to the process or maybe the questions that the clients ask which may not actually be the right questions um, to ask. Um, so I thought that was a great point that you made, but I think what I love about the work that DREV does is they don't stop at the design, that it actually goes all the way through ensuring that people actually have needs, not that there's just a better need design out there. And so I think this notion of designing within systems and designing for a whole set of users, not only the end user, um, and to Rushka's um, point, sort of designing not just a moment in an experience, but the entire experience, I think is so critical as we start to mature as designers and start to think about systems and not sort of just point-based solutions. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, I agree with you on so many fronts. It's interesting, IDEO.org uh, works on very much like a consultant basis where they come in at really specific points in a process. And I have a feeling that even though Mass has taken some projects from beginning to end, uh, and Chris as well, that they too feel like they sometimes come in at a moment and they lose control when the building is turned over to an owner or a facilities manager. Um, I'm just curious like how you and IDEO.org um, either wrestle with or kind of leverage that moment to make an impact and how you can really ensure that uh, your principles of human-centered design are carried forward. Yeah, I mean, we've really focused recently or over the past year or so on extending that time that we work with organizations and really partnering them with them deeply. So shifting, taking a shift from thinking about clients to thinking about partners and thinking about sort of acting in a consulting model versus acting in sort of a programmatic model. And so now most of our engagements are actually, you know, we're thinking about them in time frames of 18 to 24 months now and really thinking about that stewardship all the way through. So the reproductive health work we've been doing recently with Marie Stopes International in Zambia and now in Kenya, it's really an extension where we, we continue to go back and continue to support the implementation mm -hmm. and the monitoring and evaluation and the service delivery because we realize that we're actually not able to do as much as, we, as needs to be done in a three or more four month period, but that that support needs to continue um, on a much more extended period of time. So I think we're actually learning how to work more like the way that Krista and DREV do um, mm -hmm. through maybe not seeing the impact by not working all the way through previously. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, thank you. And so, Chris, um, one of the things I really admire about HOK is your commitment to research. And um, some of that research is beyond your view, of course, as an architect. Um, it's research that you have to cull from the health providers, from patients, and the patients obviously move in and out of a hospital. So you're dealing with this kind of like moving target and yet you're building facilities, and, and you've been doing this for two decades, so you're building uh, increasingly larger and larger facilities, uh, more complex, more technology. Just tell us a little bit about that. Um, I'm sure you have a lot to impart. Sure, thanks, John. Um, so let me just start by saying uh, three things that I hear when I meet people for the first time. Well, the first is, do you play basketball? <laughs> Fine. The second is, oh, I wanted to be an architect too. The third is, oh, hospitals. I, I hate hospitals. Uh, and the thing that's interesting is how is this such a universal, how is this such a universal, universal